So uh, I'm one of the surgeons. There's probably about a handful of us, maybe 20, who uh, perform surgical site reduction and administer intraperitoneal chemotherapy across the country here. And uh, I'd imagine a number of the participants here either know someone or are dealing with problems with what we call peritoneal surface malignancies. And I'll talk a little more about what that is and how we treat it. But the first thing I wanted to, to, to cover for you guys is just what the procedure is. So cytoreductive surgery, sometimes called the bulking surgery, is basically just what it sounds like. You remove all the sites of tumor in the peritoneal cavity, um, and it's basically the most important part, we'll say, in the treatment. Getting rid of all visible tumor is a mainstay in taking care of any cancer, whether it be breast cancer or colon cancer. Uh, with people who have carcinomatosis or peritoneal surface malignancies, there's often several sites in the abdomen that have to be removed, and it can be fairly time intensive. So that's the first part of the procedure and the most important part. The second part is administering the intraperitoneal chemotherapy, um, and I'll show you some examples through the presentation here. And what that does is it treats any of the little residual tumors, the little small ones that we can't see, we call those microscopic, or even tiny ones that may still be on the surface that are in parts of the abdomen that can't be removed. And it actually is, um, it works in concert with the surgery to actually reduce the risk of these tumor sites coming back. So this is going to be a little bit um, of anatomy, and uh, bear with me here. So these are just little cross-sectional images of the abdomen, and you have the liver, the stomach right here, and the kidney. And what this basically shows is that your intestines, your liver, your spleen, they all live in the abdominal cavity. There's an abdominal wall that's underneath your skin where your muscles and your fascia are. But in that space where the organs live is the problem. These tumors basically can grow on any of the surfaces of the liver or the stomach or the spleen, and all these organs are potentially involved and can potentially need to be resected at the time of surgery. Also, the space in terms of the abdominal wall right in here, you can kind of see, can also get implanted disease, and we have to either remove it or destroy it with different types of special instruments. So what you see here is a little cartoon representation of the stomach, the liver, the small intestines, and the colon. And just as a graphic example, what happens for patients is, for instance, an appendix tumor is a very common tumor that we treat with this. So the appendix is a very thin-walled organ, and it can rupture very easily. As you guys know, lots of people get appendicitis. When that happens with these tumors, little microscopic cells can kind of float all over the belly, all over the abdomen that you can kind of see demonstrated by these little red dots. And basically, these tumors can kind of grow anywhere. And where these tumors implant kind of dictates what we have to remove. And if these are large tumors, we resect them. If they're really little, that's where the intraperitoneal chemotherapy can help or special tools to destroy it. So how we determine who the surgical candidates are has several factors. So the first thing is how much disease is in the abdomen when we meet the patients. So can we actually remove all of it? Is it distributed on organs that can be removed? Because there are certain things that can't be removed, such as the liver in its entirety. Um, then the different types of tumors, and we'll go through that a little bit later in the talk, also play a role um, in how we approach it. Sometimes we do surgery up front. Sometimes we give chemotherapy and do surgery. Sometimes we do chemotherapy, surgery, and then some chemotherapy afterwards. Um, other important things we call performance status, and the simple way to think about that is just how physically fit are you? Are you in shape enough to undergo a surgical procedure, undergo anesthesia? And again, uh, whether or not uh, there are chemotherapy agents that have value for the disease and just how this tumor naturally behaves. So this is going to be, and I know, I think I can't remember if Glenn mentioned it, we are going to show some pictures of specimens, and there'll be some on this slide just to prepare you. So to give you a sense of what we take out, that structure that was on the image it kind of looked like a little apron, a fatty apron. This is what we take out. It's the omentum. And we often have to take the spleen with it. There's often extension of the disease up to the spleen. And you can kind of see over here is a good representation where the omentum and the spleen are involved. Um, that space I told you about, the lining, here's an example of the abdominal wall. And there's little tumor nodules that you can see here. This is kind of looking down in the pelvis on that same surface. And you can see there's little stipplings of disease. So we either remove this with special instruments or just resect the lining. It can be separated from the underlying muscle. Um, 
These are pictures of intestines involved with tumor. This is a picture of small bowel and colon all encased in tumor. And here's another picture of small intestine with a little bit of tumor nodularity here, which can be destroyed, and then the chemotherapy comes back through to add another layer of therapy for this disease. And then particularly in women, it's not uncommon to have to remove ovaries. This is a picture of my hand, but this shows you the, the size of an ovary right here. This is an extremely large ovary. These things are usually about a centimeter or two, but this was involved uh, with tumor. You can see some of the residual tumor as this white material here. And then right here is a picture of a uterus, and um, that would be the um, cavity where babies come from. Not to use anatomical terms, but not uncommon to have to do a hysterectomy and take the ovaries. So why do we do this and what are our endpoints? Well, whenever we do surgeries in general for things, the whole point of doing the procedures is to try to cure patients, particularly when it comes to cancer. And that's often the goal that we try to achieve. And um, many of you may be experiencing cancer or cancer relapses, and you know that's not always achievable because some cancers have a propensity of returning even after maximal therapy. Independent of curing people permanently, we can extend survival. So we can enhance people's survivals from one yep. year to two years. Yep. All right. The other thing is if people have patients have symptoms, we can actually relieve those through this process through this procedure, and, and if they don't have symptoms yeah. and we detect this on CAT scan, by removing it early can actually prevent the onset of symptoms. I think another important thing for patients who have been through chemotherapy, I think, and I, and I say this to my patients quite often, that the joys of chemotherapy are very overrated. If you've ever experienced it, it's uh, not enjoyable. So if you're looking at chemotherapy on and off for several years, Going in and removing this tumor and giving some form of a window to get people off of therapy is very important. And I think at the end of the day, everything has to be put on balance. We want to do a surgery that's not going to do anything that hastens people's survivals or, or imparts poorly on the quality of life that people are already experiencing. So we covered this at the beginning in terms of why we do cytoreduction. And we talked a little bit about the intraperitoneal chemotherapy with the primary goal to treat the micrometastatic cancers that I tried to demonstrate in that picture. Um, part of the other thing is, if you think about this, when you take a large amount of tumor out in the operating room, you're going to shed microscopic cells. So by doing this therapy for about 90 minutes or two hours, you end up taking that fraction out that can come back and be the source of re-implanted disease as well. Sure. Um, the other thing is sometimes with these tumors, they can lead to fluid buildup in the belly. We call, call that ascites, and, and it can definitely protect from that problem. So how does the intraperitoneal chemotherapy work? Um, the one thing we've learned over about the past 15, 20 years in basic science labs doing research is that cancers in and of themselves are not very good at dissipating heat. For instance, when we have a fever to fight an infection, the body was kind of designed to be able to tolerate high temperatures for a little while. Um, cancer cells, as they start to collect changes that make them cancer, become very vulnerable to temperatures that would be a high-grade fever, like 102, 103 degrees Celsius. And what we find is that that induces death in these cells. So we take advantage of that vulnerability at the time of the surgery, and what we found is when you add that heat to chemotherapy, instead of killing twice as much cancer, you can kill three to seven times as much cancer by con combining the two modalities. So the other thing that we take advantage of in the abdominal cavity is that you're basically bathing the surfaces of these organs in that space. And this is exactly where these tumors live. They live on the surface. They sometimes can penetrate up to a centimeter. And this is exact, exactly the level um, of penetration we get with the drug. The benefit of this is that the abdominal cavity in and of itself has a protective barrier, and that's called the plasma peritoneal partition. And what it means is that if you put drugs in the abdominal cavity at a very high dose, um, you can get doses probably three to four times the doses in the peritoneal cavity that you could ever tolerate in your veins. So the opposite is true, too. So if you're getting IV chemotherapy and that drug is getting circulated through your blood system to, to tumors going inside the blood vessels, you get some level of drug. But any cell that's kind of floating in the peritoneal cavity doesn't tend to get any type of drug level because it's not attached to a blood vessel. So often people with peritoneal surface disease have problems with relapses, particularly if you have a colon cancer and ovarian cancer, because 
those microscopic cells in the peritoneal cavity um, aren't really getting treated. They may go into a dormant state, but we take that opportunity at the time of surgery to really blast that fraction of cancer cells. Um, this is just some fancy mathematics uh, in the sense that the bigger the drug that we use, the more likely it's going to be contained in the abdominal cavity. It just kind of shows this here. So this is what the device looks like in a cartoon representation. We have a tube that comes in and goes into the abdomen and one that goes out on a circuit. And I'll show you here some intraoperative pictures. So this is the tube that we put in the abdomen. We close the skin um, during the procedure after all the organs are removed and have tumor in them. Uh, there's two catheters that go in up under here, up under the rib cage, uh, and we put about three liters of what we call perfusate. It's basically salt water with chemotherapy. And then this is what's called the outflow tube that we put down in the pelvis. And it's on a circulating pump where it's heated up, and it pretty much washes the belly out. So you're getting a wash effect. You're maintaining high temperatures because it's on a circulation system that heats up the agent and the drug's administered. And now this drug will slowly get absorbed in the peritoneal cavity, but often not a huge amount gets absorbed. And this is kind of a little bit of a cartoon demo of what it looks like. It's just a little circuit. So now the important thing we want to cover here is what kind of diseases are, do we treat with this? Who are candidates? And you can see this is a pretty extensive list. And uh, basically the take-home point is that anybody that has peritoneal metastasis, so this is a form of metastasis, in the peritoneal cavity is probably a candidate or should be evaluated for this procedure. Some of the common diseases that we treat include colon cancer. I'll talk in more detail about that. Appendix cancer, this is by far the mainstay therapy for appendix cancer is the surgical procedure. Uh, some patients with gastric cancer, ovarian cancer, and something called malignant peritoneal mesothelioma. So I'm going to first talk a little bit about the appendix cancers. And this is probably the, uh, this is the first disease that we started treating with this therapy, quite honestly. Um, and we have a lot of data in this. Um, prior to doing this procedure, there really wasn't a lot to offer patients in terms of long-term survival with appendix cancer, particularly patients that had a higher grade uh, disease. Now, what this slide shows is that there is a spectrum in terms of the different types of appendix cancer, um, meaning that there are what we call kind of lower grade appendix tumors and then higher grade ones. This one in particular makes a lot of mucin or uh, you can view it as, as snot and I'll show you some pictures of it for lack of a better way to describe it. So this is kind of what this pseudomyxoma peritonei looks like um, and there may be some folks out there who are doing this. But you can see right here, this is why I call it snot, it's this yellowish material and this is the stuff that causes the symptoms for the patients. It just starts to spread throughout the belly, it gets scarred in, um, and it sticks to other things. It can cause bowel blockages, and it can cause pain. People begin to lose their appetite. And to kind of give you a perspective of, of how some patients can present with this disease, I'm going to go through a little case here. So a patient I treated about six years ago um, noticed his abdomen getting bigger, and he ignored the symptoms for a while. He was a healthy guy otherwise, and then finally when it got too bad where it, it impacted on his way to eating, his ability to eat, he went in and got a CAT scan. Um, the other thing he noticed was he was more short of breath with activity. So this is what the CAT scan looked like. Um, and I know you guys aren't familiar, but it, it'll be fairly obvious as I go through this. This little lighter stuff around this, this is the liver, this is the stomach with the contrast that patients drink, and if you guys have experienced that, you, you know what it kind of tastes like chalk, it looks like chalk. This is the spleen. All this material around the abdomen is abnormal mucinous tumor. And you can see this right here that all the normal organs are being displaced back, which explains why this individual couldn't eat very well. The other thing you notice is that, that the abdomen became very protrusive, almost to the point that it's off the, the imaging screen here. And this went all the way down. These are the hip bones. So basically from the top of the bottom, uh, top of the abdomen to the bottom, you can see this patient was just full of this mucinous tumor. Um, after about a 12 to 14 hour operation, including the chemotherapy, we basically removed all of that tumor and this represents a CAT scan that was done three months after that procedure. And you can see the abdomen is back to its normal size, normal dimension. The organs are actually filling the abdomen as they should right through here. 
we had to take the spleen. Several things had to be resected. Um, and again, these are just comparative Im images of what a before and after surgery looked for this patient. And here you can see basically this individual had all of his disease removed. This is just a little bit of what we call post-surgical fluid. And this individual has been now five years out and doing fine after one procedure. Um, I think the patient was in the hospital for approximately, I'd say about 10 days after surgery, and pretty much got back to normal activity within about three to four weeks. Now, another point that I tend to like to emphasize when I give this talk to other physicians is um, people sometimes get diagnosed uh, at places where they don't quite understand what these diseases are. And this is, a, is an example of a patient who was informed about a tumor in the appendix back in 2002 and had a surgery at that time without chemotherapy, just had a standard surgery, and the patient was told that they were cured uh, by someone who didn't have a lot of experience, and this does happen. Uh, people do what they're comfortable doing um, at smaller centers in smaller towns. But unfortunately, this patient, within about two and a half years, started having symptoms like the other patient, symptoms in the abdomen. And unfortunately, they were a little slow to come in for therapy because they were dealing with illnesses and other family members. The long story short, uh, I met the patient with plans to go to surgery, but there were some complications before the surgery that happened as related to the tumor, and that can happen for patients um, when the tumor is not treated. So in this case, and I'll show you pictures, the tumor got so big in the pelvis that it pushed on the veins in the pelvis that it caused a blood clot that then migrated to the lung. So we had to postpone surgery and place the patient on blood thinners, and then once that was treated, we went in to relieve the pressure on the vessels about a month after the blood thinners were started, and then after having adequate blood thinner therapy, the patient was taken back for their full surgery. Now here I'm gonna have some intraoperative photos so you can appreciate what it looks like um, in the operating room. So what you can see here, this is a very subtle finding in the upper abdomen, but this is what we call the omentum. Just looks like an apron around your waist and that's tumor involvement. But the more striking problem is this right here is this patient's, one of the patient's ovary and these little Stripes here on the side, here's another one here, are the iliac vessels, which are basically the blood vessels that go down to your legs. And because this was applying so much pressure, that's where the blood clot started from. And in the operating room, you can appreciate this was about a 30 centimeter mass, just huge in the pelvis. And here's what the omentum looks like in surgery. So here's an omentum that's diseased. This is fairly classic appearance of omentum. And this is the mass right here in the pelvis. And more importantly, after the surgery, just like the other gentleman, uh, we had a complete clearance of the disease, and this patient is continuing to do well. Again, roughly five to six years out from one surgical intervention uh, with chemotherapy. So the point I always make to patients, and if, if you're a patient who suffers from cancer, you often run into other patients, is that, and if you have this disease or know somebody with it, that if they have been diagnosed with it, all patients should be monitored, and this last case is a good example, because it can relapse. It may be a few years, and it's much easier to take care of patients if we monitor them with CAT scans and markers and make the diagnosis before symptoms set in. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about colon cancer. This is another one that uh, can commonly spread to the abdominal cavity. Here are just some statistics. So basically, we see about 160,000 patients a year in this country diagnosed with colon cancer. So somewhere on the order of about 30,000 patients with colon cancer can develop metastasis in the abdominal cavity. Either they present with it or can develop it later in their disease course. And they can often be symptomatic. And to give you some sense of how we've made progress, over in Europe, uh, some studies were done that just looked at the natural history of colon cancer when it spreads into the abdominal cavity, and that's what this highlights. Patients who have this problem and it's not treated survive less than a year, and a lot of that's due to the fact that the bowels get blocked and nutrition becomes a problem, and um, you can get sick, obviously, if you have a bowel obstruction and that's not fixed, and, and you can't get back onto any type of uh, nutritional support. Um, What we started doing for these patients before we did this procedure was to just give standard chemotherapy, and chemotherapy is something that continues to improve, particularly for colon cancer. But the early forms of chemotherapy helped a bit. We got people out to about a year. Um, 
FIBA, the groups over in Europe are a little more organized in terms of getting studies done to show the benefit of this procedure and adding intraperitoneal therapy. And back in the early 2000s, they did a study, and you guys may have heard this term, but a prospective randomized study where they actually had patients and they either treated them with surgery and chemotherapy, which is what we do now, or they did the old treatment, which was IV chemotherapy and surgery to control symptoms. What this study revealed, as you can see, there are about 50 patients in each arm, is with older chemotherapy, uh, the survival, again, was about just over 12 months. By performing this procedure, the survival was doubled. And to make this um, more impactful, the one thing we can never determine when we meet patients until we actually do the operation is whether or not you can remove all of the disease. And part of that has to do with getting patients early in their disease course. If you get patients early when they're optimal, then your chances of clearing all the disease is quite high. And what this shows is in patients where you were actually able to effectively remove all visible tumor, the three-year survival was 95%. And a more contemporary study out of a European group has shown this with larger numbers. So over in Europe, they do have places where um, patients cannot get this procedure performed very easily, and they basically went back and compared people who had very similar tumors in this study. And what this study showed, uh, I think there were, I'm trying to think, I think there were about 100 patients in each arm, um, maybe more, maybe a couple hundred patients. But what we found now with the new chemotherapies uh, compared to that older study is that with chemotherapy alone, we get patients out probably about a good two years on average. As you can see by this curve, this is the time, and we roughly say people are cured at five years. That's where the break point is. Um, when you look at the numbers in this study, the two-year survival with just chemotherapy alone is about 65%, but when you do this surgery and, and apply chemotherapy, 81% of the patients were alive at two years. two years. And at five years, we've now improved the survival to 51%. And this pretty much um, is on par with people with liver metastasis from colon cancer. So we're pretty successful when we, again, get patients early and uh, we can remove all of the disease. And you can see if you don't have the procedure, you're looking at about 80-plus uh, percent of the patients succumbing to the disease. And this is often related to symptoms in the GI tract again, that inability to eat. Um, so now another disease where this has been completely adopted and, and, and is the only therapy is a disease called mesothelioma. And I'll briefly talk about this. This is a very rare disease. We probably only see 500 people a year. You're probably more f familiar with mesothelioma in the pleural space and asbestos exposure, but it can occur in the abdominal cavity. Um, unfortunately, prior to this procedure, these patients, again, were looking at less than a year survival. And we really haven't had any good chemotherapy like we do have available use in addition to this procedure for people with um, colon cancer. This is kind of classically what it looks like on CAT scans, but some information from the literature. So we know when patients, again, are just treated with chemotherapy and surgery, they're looking at about a year outcome. But when you do aggressive surgery and you consolidate this with the intraperitoneal chemotherapy, most people are looking at anywhere from 34 to 52 months, which is uh, basically five years, and the five-year survivals were on the order of 46 to 59 percent. And again, as I shared with you with the colon slides, uh, the colon cancer slides, the biggest factor that we run into with taking care of patients is the ability to get rid of all, all of the disease, and that's what this graph shows. So when we can get the disease down to less than a centimeter in size, this is five years, with this disease, 70% of the patients are alive and disease-free. When the residual disease is larger, particularly with this disease, because we don't have as effective chemotherapy, not any of these patients, a, a very few patients make it beyond two years. So now another one that, um, uh, and again, I'll say it, it, it seems to be somewhat controversial, but it's not, is using this therapy for Higher, highly advanced ovarian cancer. So when people have fairly extensive ovarian cancer, we would recommend they undergo this therapy as well. Um, 
And just to give some sense of ovarian cancer, which is probably one of the more common ones that presents this way, we see about 21,000 cases. Um, the bulk of these cases are advanced. For instance, in colon cancer, we can catch it early because we have colonoscopy. The appendix cancers can often present with symptoms, um, either appendicitis, but this one's a little more innocuous. Um, the interesting thing about ovarian cancer is that we do have good chemotherapy, and we can actually use that to help this group of patients. Now, this is just to give you an overview of what interesting. the outcome is for advanced ovarian cancer with tradi traditional okay. therapy. Okay. You know that if you okay. just do surgery and you give chemotherapy, that people will live about a year and a half before the disease comes back and they end up back on chemotherapy. But because chemotherapy is so good, People can cycle on and off chemotherapy and live almost five years here. 45 months is the average overall survival. And, again, there's a spectrum um, of outcome here. One of the problems with peritoneal disease, though, is that those relapses that these patients experience in about the first year and a half are in the peritoneal cavity. Almost 80% of them are related to probably this microscopic disease coming back in those spaces. And... As an, a dramatic example, I, I had a patient who basically was deemed um, not curable initially uh, when she met her medical oncologist. And this is what the CAT scan looked like. Again, I think these types of things are very illustrative of the problems that patients face and the effectiveness of the therapy. So what you can see here, this is the liver, this is the spleen, and these little nodules all over the spleen are tumor implants. Down in the pelvis, this is all tumor, bulky tumor on the uterus that's made it extremely large, and it was extremely uncomfortable for this patient. These are some ovarian nodules and ovarian tumors, some of which is um, liquid material. Now, at that point here, this patient was not a surgical candidate, but again, because chemotherapy is so good uh, in ovarian cancer, we had a dramatic downstaging, but it didn't go away. As you can see here in the spleen, you can see here that this ovary is still enlarged and there's still disease in the pelvis. So after this was all uh, completed, this patient was taken to the operating room, and again, we were able to achieve our goal, which is to remove all of that tumor. You can see here that those sites of disease are gone. And again, this patient is fairly recent, but I believe is about four to five months out, um, had a fairly uneventful hospital recovery, about 10 days, um, and then has gone back to their normal state of health. And honestly, the pain that they were experiencing, which they still had here after the chemotherapy, was completely gone at the end of surgery. So there is significant value in removing these tumors. So the take-home points that I want you guys to understand are the following. One is that this is a bigger problem than we think. I think there are a number of different diseases that can present with it, but when you put them all together, it's a fairly significant problem uh, for us in cancer. So when you kind of link gastric cancer and some of the other upper GI tract, there's probably about 20,000 patients out there that suffer from peritoneal metastasis. For colon and rectal cancer, it's about 25,000 patients. Um, appendix cancer is a little rare. It's probably about 1,500 to 2,000 patients. Um, and ovarian cancer is fairly common at about 20,000 patients. And then mesothelioma and pseudomyxoma, which is really a subtype of the appendix cancer. I thought that was. Well, um, one place and showed up another place. That's in the Now, uh, when we talk about this, these are all the patients that present with this problem. Now, not every patient that we see is a candidate for a number of reasons, either because they've uh, relapsed on chemotherapy and sometimes the disease is too extensive to be a surgical candidate. However, all patients should be evaluated. If we take a conservative estimate that roughly one-third of patients are candidates, we'd estimate that somewhere between 20 to 25,000 patients are candidates for this procedure. But the unfortunate problem we find now is that probably just over 1,000 patients are actually getting treated at the different centers that we have. So this is a bit of a problem since we're only treating 7% of the candidates. So part of this process of taking this grassroots effort is to educate patients like you that there are other options and that um, there are opportunities to eradicate this disease. Um, to give you some important points, I guess, about how we proceed with this procedure, things that you'd be interested in is, my policy is to bring people in the night before. Again, these tend to be very long operations. I would say on average eight hours. 
They can sometimes go up to 18 hours, part of which is two hours to administer the chemotherapy. So it's important that we hydrate patients the night before so they're not dehydrated. You do have to drink a bowel prep because we're going to be working on abdominal organs. Um, and then the night before, we have the anesthesiologist assess the patient. Um, we put in epidurals, and if any of you have had surgery before, you know that these are very good at controlling postoperative pain. Um, we put in devices to monitor the blood pressure and ways to administer fluid and the, treat the fluid shifts that happen in the operating room. Also, one of the things that we routinely do is give patients a blood thinner that reduces their risk of blood clots that can be related to any surgical procedure, and we administer antibiotics. Um, in terms of, in general, the post-operative stay in the ICU is somewhere between a day to three days. Um, if there's complications, which can happen with any surgery, then the stay can be longer. The average hospital day can run the spectrum of a week to 21 days. Again, if there are any problems which are related to the surgery, then the stay can be prolonged. Um, my experience has been that most people can get, back to, can get back to work within a month, barring any complications. And then after the procedure, um, I always tell my patients that cancer is just like your blood pressure. Even if we're successful in putting it into complete remission, you still have to be monitored. And that's where you come in for CAT scans every three to four months. Uh, for the first two years, we know that most patients uh, will experience a relapse. If they're going to relapse, it will happen in the first two years at a higher risk. So we surveillance very heavily. But then once you cross that, landmark, then we'll go on to six months, and then after five years, we go on to yearly surveillance. So I always tell patients that even after you've crossed the five-year mark, there is a chance you can have a problem with your tumor coming back. The further you get away from your first surgery, though, the more likely that if you do sustain a relapse that you'll be very treatable again, um, and often that surgery won't be of the magnitude of the first surgery. Um, and I thank you guys for your attention. And what we're going to do, we're eventually going to open it up for questions. But